Coming to you from Claremont, California, I'm Colin Marshall. This is the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. Today I'm sitting down with Jonathan Leatham. He is the Roy E. Disney Professor in Creative Writing here at Pomona College and the author of... Oh, Lordy, quite a few books uh, in terms of novels. He's the author of novels like Gun with Occasional Music, Girl in Landscape, You Don't Love Me Yet, and most recently came out last year, Dissident Gardens. He's the author of short story collections like The Wall of the Sky, The Wall of the Eye, or is it the yeah, other way around? I got, I got it right. Or, or Men in Cartoons, or the upcoming collection of short stories. Is it a different kind of tension? Is they, that the title? I, that was the title I submitted it under. And, and oh, it's circular. Don't know yet. It, no, it's it got a new title. It's been, it, it, but that, that phrase circulates a little bit, so it's like a phantom title for it. It's going to be called Lucky Allen and Other Stories. Lucky Allen and Other Stories. The record is corrected here, right up front. <laughs> He's the author of monographs on, uh, oh, Works like John Carpenter's film They Live or Talking Heads album Fear of Music. Uh, he's the co-author with Christopher Sorrentino of a book on the 2005 Mets. And I'm, I'm leaving a lot out of this, but in the words of Robert Christgau, the man writes a lot, and he reads a lot as well. So, Jonathan, let me propose this to you. I, I'll, I've often thought that we should all just stop recommending things on the basis that they're good. Oh, this book is great. This book is awesome. This is the best book you'll ever read. We should get rid of all that and instead tell the story of how we encountered the thing we're recommending, be it book, be it film, be it album. What do you think of that? Is that doable? Well, yeah. I mean, you're sort of talking about personal canons, and and um, I, I guess I've always been in the in the position that the the sequence of discoveries, the way my image, uh, you know, kind of the hologram of a, uh, a, a world of, of books and, and writers and, and, you know, what literature was, what it could be, uh, was extremely eccentric, very particular, and, and kind of infinitely precious to me, that I didn't want to have it uh, um, Overwritten by um, some other kind of hierarchy, or by you know the the, <laughs> the primitive systems of genre, or the, what what would you call it, the brow system, high, low, and oh, sure. middle. But that <laughs> but that I I <laughs> that I I liked the the um, kind of palace of 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 literature that I that I discovered, even if it was. Um, uh, determined by, you know, just peculiar circumstance. My parents' bookshelves, uh, you know, when I was born, where I was born, the, 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 for that matter, the collections of books at this, you know, the school libraries at public schools in New York City in the 1970s. Mm -hmm. Somebody recently gave me a piece of treasure. They gave me a copy of, um, uh, one of the, um, uh, Dr. Doolittle books by Hugh Lofting mm -hmm. that had a, a library card in it with my name written in it from PS 29 <laughs> in like 1976 <laughs> or 77. Or it would have been even earlier, I guess it would have been like 1974. Uh, and um, it was like just having this incredible, it was like, so, you know, going in a time machine to just hold this object. And mm. it was, uh, I, I, you know, I, I suppose people can become quite exhausted with the constant assertion of a, uh, you know, subjective first person into the critical uh, voice. I know that you know some people who um, wanted, like, like, let's say, wanted a um, a good solid account of the Fear of Music recording sessions <laughs> were were pissed off that. I kept talking about uh, myself as a teenager listening to the record, and I I don't really even have a quibble if you're not you know if you're not uh, interested in hearing that that kind of uh, critical voice. The you know I, I I myself I have a constant appetite for it. You know I just I just read uh, Grill Marcus's newest book, The Ten. Uh, history of rock and roll in ten songs, and you know, it's it's relentlessly eccentric and suffused with with Greel's perspective and his um, his priorities. You know, it doesn't pretend to any kind of stable uh, theoretical or, or objective stance. That that works for me. It turns me on. But 
putting aside whether or not it's the kind of critical writing you want to read, I mean, you're suggesting that it should replace everything. Uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. Let's maybe not. let's let's hold off. But as a you know, for me, it's a helpless stance. Right. It's how I'm oriented. I I I write as a reader uh, encountering, reaching out into this cultural space that's created by my own eccentric appetites. Right. And I just can't stop doing that, and I can't <laughs> disguise that I'm doing that. I'll put it this way. Let's say I picked up your book on Fear of Music and had never heard the album. I would not be moved to buy that album <laughs> by reading the story of its recording sessions. I, mean, I don't know, maybe if they were particularly unusual sessions, but... I definitely wouldn't be moved if you were just saying how great the album is. This is a greatly great album. This is this is number one. I made all these lists. Fear of Music was on number one of all of them, no matter who you were. But the story of your relationship with that album and how the relationship developed, as if it were a relationship with a place or a person, only that, I could only envision that moving me to hear the album, to buy the album, had I, if, if I didn't already own it. I mean, there's oh, a sense... I mean, who knows? Yeah. It's a pretty useless book if you don't know the music. <laughs> let's 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 be clear. But you know, this gets to the whole question. It was one that I'm I'm enmeshed in in different ways, over and over again. But it always changes of referentiality in uh, in in writing, in in fiction, in in essays, in in critical pieces. You know what? Um, what do you do about the fact that language and description and then also scenes in fiction are entrenched, all of them, in different ways, entrenched in particularities of culture and language and politics, that they all, you know, that this, this um, material world of stuff and situations um, keeps language from ever doing, floating unmoored into some sort of free, abstract beauty. Instead, it wants to, like, talk about stuff mm -hmm. and we're all here doing that all the time and 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 you know i used to i used to kind of think i should fight that i i i I'd, I'd been a painter and you know um was the uh quote all art aspires to the condition of music which is what's the condition of music that you know that it's like a siren song that seems to pull us out of the prosaic mm -hmm. uh entrenchment in daily crapola or specifics <laughs> like oh you know that the, the 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 harp or the 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 guitar or the the soprano's voice is just taking me outside myself outside of ego and culture and context into pure pure beauty and so that uh you know in some weird way i had it i had a kind of investment in the idea that the less referential uh the better mm. but that doesn't really well you know but it's just an idea you happened to latch onto and ran with for a while. Well, it didn't. It didn't uh, turn out to get me where I needed to go. Right. It, with the the form I'd chosen and the inclinations and investments that were particular to me, the things I liked, the ways I liked to talk about them, uh, the kind of character I felt myself to be, and therefore the kind of person I was going to end up writing about in my fiction. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed to me. Human lives were actually made up of all these references. These, they were that, that I was a kind of compendium of relationships to culture and language, and um, that the particulars and the circumstances and the details, even the factoids or the the trivia, was going to actually um, be a way in to the most essential matter for me, and that I was going to have to talk about those things uh, directly, name things a lot, drop a lot of names, even at the risk of having someone say, "Well." You know, what does it mean to me if I don't, if I've never heard, you know, play that funky music, white boy? I don't know. I can try to help you. I can try to surround it with description. I can hope that it's been like, you know, the reference has been enshrined in the, in the prose in some way that charges it meaningfully, gives it an emotional power, no matter your familiarity. But I'm going to have to work with that stuff. It's what I've got. Right. I mean, when someone says, oh, I read this book, it's so good, what that means is, I have entered into a relationship with this book, right? My next, my next in impulse, instinct is to say, well, what is that relationship? You know, let's let's talk about what you're actually talking about here. It's uh, good alone doesn't really mean anything, does it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's right. That's the, the the great greatness. 
It's at the top of the charts. <laughs> yeah. I guarantee it. I see, number one. There's ten on this list, and it's number one. <laughs> yeah, except for that one day when it was like at number seven. I don't know what went wrong, but it just it just sucked that day. Yes, I don't know what happened. Things happen. Yeah. Mm. There's a quote oft, oft, oft referenced, and you use it in one or two of your essays as well. I often attributed to Frank Zappa that uh, writing about music is like dancing about architecture with the the. <laughs> Implication I read is that it's impossible or futile. And I've long thought, like, we know that's not true, right? I mean, people well, we can... definitely know it's not impossible, right? People are yeah. doing it. People are like, even as we speak, they're writing about music. So what are they doing? Is it, is it, is, does the, just, does the dancing about architecture mean that they are, they are ipso facto inane or misguided? Or, or, you know, I mean, it might mean that it's like, uh, really amazing because dancing about architecture sounds kind of cool you could probably do it too yeah and you know it catches the 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 magical permanent you know weirdness of trying to stick language onto other things mm. which is a problem not just with music but with uh you know us having this conversation or um you know me trying to move uh the body of a character through a a room in a way that makes meaning erupt or or emotion or or implication erupt on the page for the reader by using words like he crossed the room and reached for the door you know how is this to be how is this meant to uh how can we go on <laughs> trying such an impossible thing but it's also where the action is it's what it's what we love right when it when it happens um, yeah, and you know, I mean, the other part of that quote, of course, if it was Frank Zappa, we know that he was uh, probably sneering at somebody, <laughs> right? So it's, it's um, don't touch me with your critical language, which is an impulse anyone who's laid enough stuff out into the uh, opinion marketplace can sometimes relate to. It's just like, oh... Could I, could I, this time, could I like not be reviewed? Could I just yeah. go directly to the readers, uh, you know, steer a berth around the entire situation of having people uh, evaluate it in, in critical language? But what are the readers going to do when they talk to each other? Well, you know, uh, maybe they don't have to talk to each other. They could just mutely hand one another the book, right? <laughs> I'm being, I'm being a, a fool. Under the, under the table, hopefully, no one, no one must see. So, you know, so there's that part of that quote, too. It's just sort of, it's like, um, uh, it's describing something he thinks is kind of icky and contemptible. Um, but what's great about the quote is that he put it in such an amazing uh, kind of, you know, sur a sur surreal but, but um, open-ended metaphorical, you know, aphorism that now we're all, like, we can all think about dancing, about architecture, and it can, it can, play different ways it can mean different things mm. instead of just getting you know saying something cranky <laughs> right it can be there are richer interpretations of that quote the irony is that he kind of his quote is a little bit like a a a, a dance around architecture it's mm. better than it means to be right yes yes <laughs> the, the tale is subtler than the teller in this case yeah. mm. There's a certain piety a lot of people have about it, though. They want to read it as, oh, that's impossible to then to write about. You can't write about music. Music's too cool to write about or say too, too direct, which is, well, I mean, why do, why would people want to believe that if indeed they do want to believe that? Well, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. What do people want to believe about art? That's always the question. What do people really, want to it's believe? It's really a great thing. I mean, I actually, I, I, I so often find myself like, um, Realizing I've sort of um, run up against romantic images of the artist uh, and and or of the artwork, and I have them myself. I'm very reverent about the things that I love, and I grew up with this intense romantic image of the creator and the creative process, even though at the same time it was very... Um, uh, close to home. I mean, my dad was in the house painting. So it wasn't esoteric. I knew people made stuff. And I've tended to, you know, I've tended to think that that remark 
needs emphasizing. So I go around mostly uh, de-romanticizing the process. When people ask me about my own efforts, you know, I'll say, well, you know, I sat and I, I sort of worked hard and I revised it and, and I've, you know, I've done this slightly unromantic thing of pointing out sources a lot, you know, po poking a little hole in the balloon of the romantic image of the Promethean individual creator who sort of pulls it out of the vacuum. Why do we want to think creators are doing that? Well, why do we want to think it's impossible for us? I guess that's, you know, that's where I come full circle. And I think because of what it does to us, because of what it means to us, and I, and that's not something I actually really want to monkey with. Yeah. That's when I sometimes draw myself up short and I think, why am I working so hard to disenchant uh, this um, this magical image. It's actually a really precious one that we that we hold people in this kind of exalted framework for making things. Some of them, some few of them, every once in a while for making things that just totally, you know, uh, blow our heads, the tops of our heads off. Uh, we want to like be in awe. We you know we want in a way to walk into the the room where you know like when I was twenty seven and. Don DeLillo uh, finally consented to go on a small reading tour. He came to, he came to Berkeley, to Black, Oaks, Black Oak Books in Berkeley, and I connived a, a front row seat uh, because I was a bookseller, so I got the other bookstore. I got Black Oak to agree to let, let me have a seat in the front. You know, there was, a, it was a lot of, there was a lot of energy in the room that came from basically people um, – Equating DeLillo with some sort of, uh, you know, heroic, uh, defiant, impossible, exalted image of a creator. Because for me and these other people, his books had seemed so, you know, so extraordinary. And so it, he, he represented this kind of unattainable uh, possibility. Um, but, you know... Folks, okay, he puts his pants on one leg at a time, one, one leg at a time, right? Uh, it can be revealed. Yeah. And so, but I didn't, at that moment, I didn't want to have that bubble burst. It was very important to me to go and sit in that front row and be sort of tremulous with excitement. And that was despite the fact that I already, like I said, I'd grown up with, with uh, a painter dad. Believe me, I, I, I figured out he had feet of clay at some point. I myself had written... I hadn't published yet, but I'd, I'd published short stories. I'd written a novel and a half. I knew that it was just work. You did it, like painting. It came out well or badly. If it came out badly, you might improve it by working harder. It wasn't, you know, um, a, 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 an act of sorcery. But that guy there, he's done a lot of that work. That guy up at the front of the room, he's, he's done, done a, lot of, a lot of it, and that's well, impressive. That, that, of course, you know, the, the image of... That's the thing is that the the holy image, the image that I'm not sure I always want to deflate, is one that's made up of contradictory aspects. We both think the artist is magical and that they're, you know, um, admirable in this in this kind of muscular. You know, they've persisted. They've done something. They've they're human beings who've fought in a war or whatever. You know, whatever the image might be, the metaphor might be. They. They, you know, they're they're John Henry. They like, they they did something uh, individual and extraordinary, and they're you know they're athletes. They beat the steam shovel. Yeah, I I, I guess you know, but it's um, like a lot of fantasies. It's useful when it's uh, creates positive energy and enchantment and uh, positive implications. It's a disaster area when it makes people, for instance, feel um, betrayed when artists turn out to be human beings, or yes. when it makes people feel sort of ipso facto uh, disqualified. Like, I can never make this thing happen. I could never Phew. be that person. Uh, those are those are bad fantasies. Right. So those ones need to be exposed. Right. It's I remember reading in a Paris Review interview you gave a few years ago, you were talking about, you mentioned DeLillo in this context, but also Haruki Murakami, a novelist who's been in the press lately because I guess whenever a book of his comes out, he gets in the press. Interestingly, among my circle, 
the fandom of him and of yours is a 100% overlap. Really? If they like his, they like yeah. yours. If they like yours, they like his. But he's such a contrast because he seems to not care about revealing his non-musical influences. He just, he says, I go into my study and I write and I'm, I'm boring yeah. except for the writing. So yeah. he's that's smarter than I am because he's just made his own conversation so much simpler. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, there's so many different reasons that artists become, uh, uh, artists collude with the, the romantic fantasy. I mean, one is that they may feel in a very root sense that it's um, dangerous. Just within the space of their own creativity, they can't think about their process too uh, practically or in terms of influence or, uh, or procedure because it's precious and it might be damaged. So it's not even about like shaping their image in other people's eyes. It's that they need to keep themselves a little bit mysterious to themselves. Mm. I don't happen to have that apprehension. Mm. Or maybe I'm just, I'm just, uh, you know, maybe I'm like autistic that way. But in some way, the mm. procedural aspects of it always seem really plain to me. I don't know how I would disguise them from myself. And therefore, it seems really bogus to, um, to, to uh, pussyfoot around it with too much with other people, to mystify it when it doesn't feel mysterious to me. Mm. But I think a lot of people end up in that space, not in bad faith, but because they've usefully or, or, or necessarily kept things a little bit mystical in their own, mm. in their own thinking. Some other people might uh, decide that the mystique is great and therefore do it on purpose. But I think also... Sometimes it can seem um, like you're uh, giving too much ammunition to people who want to pick at you. Mm. And, you know, having done so much, been so relentlessly descriptive, oh, yeah, I was thinking of this and referring to that. You know, I can feel a little bit hoist by my own petard when I see somebody say, oh, yeah, he's just a magpie. <laughs> and I'm like, I didn't say I was more a magpie than anyone else. I said I'm telling you about it when they right. didn't. You I'm know? just the one saying it. You know? <laughs> um, and, um, you know, so you might choose to, like, not give over that description. Mm. But um, I also think sometimes class stuff enters into it. Mm. I think a lot of American, and this doesn't really speak to Murakami, of course, but a, a lot of American writers are caught up in a, uh, well, a very typical, very American situation of wanting to to believe themselves to be authentic in a way that being a part of an intellectual elite or being part of a kind of aristocratic cl class uh, would, would um, you know, um, would discredit. Mm. And so it's kind of the fantasy of being the guy in overalls. <laughs> you know, I'm just a worker. I just do my thing. I don't know how it goes. You know, I'm not in management. Don't ask me about that. Uh, that's above my pay grade. It's the kind of, you know, you see this a lot. I mean, obviously, you, you, a really uh, <laughs> exaggerated version of this is the, like, the abstract expressionist painters in work boots mm. who, well, I mean, now, in fact, uh, you know, Jackson Pollock may have been an inarticulate dude, right? He may have just not been great with the palaver, but there's no question that in his wake, this image of the painter as the sort of grunting, uh, you know, primitive who just makes stuff. It's very, uh, it's very direct. I just do this thing, and I, you, you talk, you tell me what it means. You know, the critics. That's the critic's job. This becomes a kind of a uh, inherited um, uh, stance that that starts to look kind of silly when it's, especially when it's propagated by people who come from extremely intellectual art traditions. Mm. And, you know, most writers are intellectuals of some stripe or another. They're certainly capable of talking about things because they work in language. Uh, but you still see it reproduced by some writers who have a fantasy of authenticity that comes from being the inarticulate, uh, I don't know, I'm just a storyteller. Yeah, you know. i got to go smoke. Um, Stop asking yeah, this, you guys. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the, the, the brainiacs, worry about those. The questions you're asking me, that's for the pointy heads. I just do this thing. Um, well, I've, I've never been uh, tempted, or I never could play. I just couldn't. I, I was never in a position to play that card. Partly, actually, because 
I come, you know, here I am now. I'm going to play an authenticity card, right? Sure. My dad, along with being a painter, was also a carpenter, mm -hmm. <laughs> and I went to public school. I mean, I I I knew people whose hands were calloused and their work boots were dirty because they'd actually gone off and done a day's work. So to kind of play act it <laughs> to all, that drag always seemed really objectionable to me. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, I switched from the visual arts to to writing where it. It's especially uh, peculiar. It's really, it's really a quite, quite a, um, a a piece of kabuki for for the writers to act like they're sort of uh, heaving and grunting in, in the <laughs> workshop. Uh, they're they're we're all, you know, sitting on our big fat lily white asses, moving the least amount of our body we can. You know, our fingers are tr tickling the keyboards. It's really not that masculine or or um, or you know, and and it. it the uh, the working man's pose doesn't really befit us very very neatly. So anyway, but you know, I I I'm not I don't mean to like cast other people's ways of doing this stuff in you know in all sorts of disdain. I more am the way I am out of enthusiasm. You know, I mean, uh, I I like uh, reading criticism. So it, and I, I you know, I, I grew up as influenced in my interest, you know, my desire to be a writer, for whatever reason, was as much about wanting somehow to, like, make fiction that had a relationship to the criticism that drove me crazy. Mm -hmm. When I was a teenager, Leslie Fiedler and Grill Marcus and, um, you know, um, Manny Farber, and I was like, there's some kind of crazy action happening there that's alive to me, and it's like thinking embodied mm. and i'm going to i'm going to write about characters that 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 care for this that think this way sometimes anyway you know a book like chronic city partly comes out of that but also i want my fiction to feel uh as alive uh you know as much like thinking embodied as it as i want it to be just storytelling i want it to be like the language and the 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 the, the quality of engagement voice is going to matter to me as much as the uh you know characters and 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 what their problems are in the scene mm. i mean there's that idea that today if you write a book set in the modern day and the characters don't use the internet you're writing something bizarre and unrecognizable in some way in the same sense to me if i'm reading a book set in the modern day and characters they're not they don't engage with the criticism of things, given how much of that I hear and read myself on a daily basis, that too would be bizarre. I was burgeoning with all this, like, you know, top drawer and middle drawer and totally bottom drawer, yeah. like, uh, thinking about culture. It's like, it's our lives. It's, we're stuck inside it, right? It's like the way, you know, I grew up in a world of signage, commercial signage, graffiti, billboards. It's like, Language was the environment. It was as, you know, I didn't grow up in the woods. <laughs> I didn't grow up on a ranch. And, yeah, right, you're right. Characters, contemporary characters are drunk on critical dialogue. All we do is, like, every dinner party is, you know, what was wrong with season three of The Killing, yes. right? So uh, it is a false naivete. Uh, to, you can't do very much with the texture of contemporary life if you don't get this stuff into it. But people are embarrassed by it. And, 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 you know, Laura Miller writes about this very articulately at some point is that, uh, what people want from contemporary writing is, um, two different opposed things. Mm -hmm. They want to see their lives reflected and if not, you know, understood, how could we expect them to be understood? But just, um, we want the, the, the problem of being alive right now to be framed in a way that we recognize mm -hmm. But at the same time, most people turn to literary reading, like the latest novel that they've heard is really good. <laughs> There's that word again. In a way, aspirationally. Mm -hmm. They they do it in order not to, to watch season three of The Killing, but to feel like they are the kind of person who sometimes reads a serious book. And so if what they find inside the contents is too much contemporary texture that embarrasses them, right. it's like they almost got 
tricked. They, <laughs> this they, book has not one mention of HBO in it. Look, I'm reading it. They wanted to be in a place that was like better than everyday life <laughs> because that's what reading literature means to them. Mm. Well, you know, then you're stuck, I guess, reading like a you know a book set on a ranch or something. Right, about, or something very old. Or something very old. Yeah. Mm. It's. The type of recommendation that I, before I ever read your books, I would hear friends say or read criticism that said, you know, this is, the, as you say, the sort of run-of-the-mill criticism. His books are really good. you got to read them. I really liked his books, uh, which is all fine and dandy, but I didn't start actually picking up your books until I heard Jonathan Lethem has a relationship with the works of, you know, most famously Philip K. Dick, mm. Steve Erickson, Borges, J.G. Ballard. What, what do those writers have in common, by the way? Oh, well, the list you just gave, right. So, I mean, it's where I began in a way, mm. was conceive a very, very intentional self-conception as uh, uh, a, a surrealist. Mm. And I think that's the only word that really covers how I felt really about what I wanted to have the books and the stories do. Mm. Now, lots of other names were proposed, and some of them I accepted or, or, or flirted with. You know, I was a science fiction writer at one point. I definitely, you know, even my publisher, I think, marketed me as an American magic realist, which is oh, such mm. an awful term. <laughs> I didn't feel like any of the three words fit. I didn't feel American or magic or realist. I mean, it's, it's a hard <laughs> zero for three. But, but you know, and then and then later this thing called Slipstream comes along, which seems kind of kind of twee to me. It sounds like a boutique, you know, for those who like a little bit of this in there, you know, a little bit of peanut butter on their chocolate. <laughs> Uh, I just wasn't into it because um, really I wanted stuff that messed with you. I wanted stuff that both created uh, an overwhelming sensation of recognition. Yes, life is like this. I'm like this. Uh, the world feels this way. And then to have the veneer twist off so that it remained visible – Oh, recognition and now estrangement, mm. wrongness, weirdness, something that makes me think really differently in a really uncomfortable way about uh, what I take for granted as, as myself or as my everyday life or, or, or the world around me. And this is what Borges and Dick and Steve Erickson do so, so beautifully, so radically. And the other writers that I most powerfully associated at the start with this ambition – were uh, Calvino, um, Cortazar, tremendously important writer to me, and is very underrated now. I'm not read enough, mm. you know. I mean, God, if you, if you're digging Bolaño, or you know Murakami at his best, or if you you know wonder uh, you know where some of you know David Foster Wallace's weirdest moves come from. Mm. You gotta look at Cortazar. What a great writer, and so undervalued now. Mm. Um, and and a couple of other uh, American genre writers who messed with me in the right way. Uh, Robert Sheckley, who I later had the luck of anthologizing. Um, you know, in the best stories, his best twenty stories or so. Um, Thomas Dish, mm. uh, Patricia Highsmith. Charles Williford, who I find he's a, he's an extraordinary. He's like a native uh, American, very vernacular, very uh, blue collar in some ways. But he's also he's like a Nabokov. His mm -hmm. his vision of uh, what narration can do is as um, mannerist and um, destabilizing as Nabokov at his best, you know, the way he uses unreliable narration. Um, and, you know, at the baseline for a lot of this stuff for me was also uh, Lewis Carroll. The first thing I loved still absolutely, uh, yeah, I feel it's emanations through my exploration of, of, of the literary surreal. You know, I'm always looking for, in a way that, same jolt that Lewis Carroll gave me when I was, you know, 10 years old, that, um, you know, that your Alice and the f animals and the flowers are talking. But the problem isn't that they're talking. The problem is that they're 
they're really unpleasant. <laughs> they're, 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 the problems they're presenting to you are like yours to solve, right. and you're immediately immersed in their fucked up viewpoint. <laughs> you know, it's not, hey, wait, the flower is talking. It's, oh crap, yeah. the flower needs this. Yes. You know, and they're, ta- ta- they're talking in there. Yeah. This this ain't pleasant. And they've just got agendas, and you're stuck <laughs> inside their agendas. Um, and that's, you know, that's to, the, to me the pure essence. And of course, I found it shortly after that. I found it in Kafka and Dick, who become mm-hmm. the, I guess, the paradigmatic writers for me at, at a young age. But then, of course, you know, I also, something else happened, which is I, so this is what I thought I was going to be. This is what I thought I was, I was born to do, was, you know, not to become as great as these guys, but to write in their direction to, to make stuff that, you know, that might, uh, knock on that door, uh, and build on, on, on the world that they, they, to me, it was a literary constellation. And I was like, if I could just make one little twinkly star in that space, I would be satisfied. Um, but something else happened that really was the involuntary part of my coming of age as a writer, Mm -hmm. which is that, um, I mean, first of all, I didn't read that way exclusively. I read that way voraciously. I was always looking for stuff that would fit that description. You know, like, oh, my ear was to the rail. Kobo Abe is the Japanese Kafka. Okay, I'm going to read all of Kobo Abe. You know, like, I'm going to find the stuff that Stanislaw Lem. Okay, he's for me too, you know, Angela Carter. Um, but out of habit, uh, because I am, was a very, very Catholic reader, and also because of the time and place where I grew up and also because of what was on my parents' shelves, I always also read, you know, like the kind of, um, uh, um, well, specifically, uh, mid-century American semi-autobiographical fiction, a lot of it Jewish that was on my parents' shelves. I read Henry Roth and then Philip Roth. I read Bellow and Mailer, uh, and and um, I read Styron, and I read, uh, you know, early Updike. Couples was, was a very interesting book for a teenage boy to read. No doubt. Uh, you know, I was taking a lot of the stuff in. I read Henry Miller. You know, he's from Brooklyn. He's weird. He's sexy. <laughs> What's he about? I read so much of this stuff that was, uh, that didn't fit this very deliberate concept I had about. You know, what would an American Kafka write like or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. what would a, a more polished Philip K. Dick do? Right. Um, and it was in me, too. And it began to kind of come out of me in a certain way uh, when I in when I was halfway home in my journey of self-creation. I started this book, Motherless Brooklyn, and the first chapter is like present time chase scene. It was like a film noir thing. It seemed very uh, interesting and gene- generic in a good way to me. And I was thought I'd thought up a very clever idea with this detective with Tourette's. It wasn't meant to be a uh, autobiographical book, but then I, mm, yeah, I just I needed to do like the Ross McDonald thing. The front story of a of a good crime novel almost always turns out to be about deep backstory. Mm-hmm. Ancient family traumas, you know, that's like kind of the archetypal structure. And so I started putting the past into the book. And the past was that these guys had gone to public school in Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. And suddenly I was like a different writer <laughs> overnight, by, just by setting down the words chapter two in 1978, you know, and I was like, whoops. Suddenly I was doing like a little bit of like Henry Miller in Black Spring or, you know, uh, I was I was drawing on The Assistant by Malamud. I was drawing on, you know, uh, you know, um, Philip Roth and, uh, and it was okay. That stuff seemed to be okay for me. It had, it had some relevancy. I had to, uh, adjust my self-definition and, and let it happen. And everything since then has obviously, uh, been as much about that kind of engagement, the, the, the unexpected one as it is with that, you know, that first image. To tie together three of the names you just mentioned, Kobo Abe is, of course, often regarded as, as the Japanese Kafka, and he would get mad in life saying, 
Why doesn't anybody see I'm the Japanese Lewis Carroll? That's who I really no, am. I Have you heard that? that. Yes. That's great. Beautiful. <laughs> Perfect. You know how, like, um, common denominators are – there's often, like, the secret – and I, I'm obsessed with these lineages. I think Grill Marcus taught me to think critically this way, like to notice that uh, rather than coming from nowhere, that like there's some Buddy Holly DNA in Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. that like certain moves in Bob Dylan didn't come from nowhere. They came just right out of Buddy Holly. It's less interesting if they came from nowhere. I think so. So, you know, I think Lewis Carroll is... He looms really large. And, and I'm always looking for that writer who's a little bit behind. You know, like, even, like, the way Borges talks about G.K. Chesterton, mm -hmm. you're like, well, maybe we should have a look. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I read, you know, I, I read that writer. I always want to reach for that, that, that writer who is, uh, you know, like, our sense of um, where the contemporary short story comes out of is very much Hemingway. Like, mm -hmm. it's just like, you know, the short Happy, happy Life of Francis McComer and you know, big two-hearted river. This, this, this idea that whether you're talking about, you know, the Raymond Carver school or, you know, he's in, he's in even, you know, Ann Beatty or, or, or even someone weird like Donald Barthelme or that, that, you know, you kind of have to look at Hemingway as this sort of, so, okay, so, but who did Hemingway think short stories came from? Mm -hmm. Well, if you check, it turns out he's really specific about it. He's like the guy who invented the short story, as far as I'm concerned, who, who blew his head off, What you know, in, in Hemingway's own account, was Rudyard Kipling, mm -hmm. which, you know, extremely out of fashion, racist, <laughs> colonial, kids' book writer. You know, we don't think of Kipling as, as being relevant to our present understanding of, uh, Anything. of letters. <laughs> you know, it's like he's just embarrassing about four different ways. Yeah. But you've got to go and figure out what did he read like, what did he seem like, what did he do that... that that made because then you find out oh mom doffs his hat you know Somerset mom doffs his hat too to Kipling it's like he was the story writer mm -hmm. he was the one who like reoriented what the short story could do mm -hmm. and so these these secret progenitors I think Lewis Carroll you know I don't know if Kafka read him I, I wonder if anyone knows whether Kafka read him but the fact that Abe uh, oh yes that makes total sense to me that's great that's <laughs> that's lovely do you think here as we sit in 2014 we're living more in, in the reality that a Philip K. Dick or a, or a J.G. Ballard described or less in it or sort of the same in it? Well, here's the thing. The reason a, a ostensible, you know, prognosticator like Dick or Ballard, the reason that their work seems so intensely descriptive of our present experience isn't because they, in the 50s or 60s, or early 70s, went through some, you know, had some looking glass, went through some time tunnel, <laughs> and glimpsed 2014. It's because they were writing as ferociously, as fiercely, and accurately about the undertow of their present experience. The, 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 they were expressing the inexpressible aspects of 19, you know, 60 two or 1973 uh, that that were you know they they didn't feel anyone else was finding language for they were describing their present better than others were able to do you know and and so you know time Time moves very slowly in some regards. The cultural implications of, you know, the Cold War, the political implications, the consciousness implications of uh, the technological revolutions that were happening under the watch of, you know, these mid-20th century post-war writers who, you know, Someone like Philip K. Dick or J.G. Ballard, they made themselves into an open nerve <laughs> for, the, for the actual experience, not the future experience, the yeah. present experience of the, you know, space era or the, the, the uh, you know, era of mutual assured destruction or the first inklings of um, a, a digital media 
you know, the, the possibilities of digital media and its, its uh, power on consciousness. Or even, you know, I mean, in Dick's case, really specifically, the, the things that Madison Avenue, the, the, um, uh, the axis of Madison Avenue and the Pentagon were doing to reality. Yeah. By describing, you know, 1956 or 1967 or whatever with such, uh, you know, s- extraordinary sensitivity... You know, and I mean that in the sense of vulnerability. They laid themselves bare to the power of the present. They told us what it was like to be alive now. If, if they remain, if their work remains effectively diagnostic of our reality, what aspect of it are they diagnosing so well still? Well, I mean, you know, things that critical or theoretical writers struggle to do still to say what happened when you know global transmission when even something like radio overtook civilization let alone when televised images started to saturate our individual and collective brains i mean this is hard work to say what was different before about experience, about possible, you know, about human, uh, the, the fragile, you know, uh, nature of human consciousness, and it's um, even just an individual psyche, let alone in the formation of families, societies, you know, relations in a in a nation, in a state, in a, <laughs> you know, these are, but well, anyway, these changes, their weirdness, their intensity. They're encoded in these stories that were told, and stories that were told, you know, on the on the on the fly, on the spot, catching some like glimmer. It's like having a series of consciousness cameras mm. taking random snapshots. Um, although with someone like Dick, who did it for several decades, or Ballard, you'd say the same thing. They they obviously had a you know freakish propensity for, for putting that. <laughs> that consciousness camera in the right place, you know, <laughs> like, 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 you know, Eugene at J in Paris, it's not an accident that they just again and again were able to like say what it felt like. And, you know, the reason, the reason they wrote so brilliantly, I think about these matters is that they were, you know, probably more afraid and at the same time, braver. Mm. You know, they didn't flinch. Um, they were, they were just, they were, they were witnesses. Anybody who's a fan of yours will have read, will have read you reference the Brooklyn of of your, uh, the Brooklyn in which you grew up uh, before, and, and they'll they'll know some sto- they'll know some of your backstory about how you left college to go to the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area. Did you? Is it true you went there because Philip K. Dick had lived there? <laughs> yeah, no, it was. It, in, in the story I told myself then, and you know, the, the only story that's sort of uh, credible, I, I, I had a very. I, it was a, it was a shadow of a plan, a ghost of a plan. <laughs> I was in high school. I didn't want to go to college. I wanted to do something else, and that something else was it was made up of a muddle of of projections and fantasies that were cobbled together from all sorts of. Aspects of my, I guess you'd call it my countercultural identification. I was really into the beats. I was really into science fiction. I was really into um, what I thought of as Zen Buddhism. It's a joke. I'm, I'm, I'm not a student of, of Zen, but I was like reading Alan Watts and um, and and having this idea of, you know, it was like a a stew of. For a New York kid, it was a stew of fantasies about escape from what had become like intolerable uh, kinds of apprehension or 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 proximity. I just felt like the the city and my my fate within it were were too much, mm-hmm. and I wanted to run away to you know the the mountain from from 
Kerouac's Dharma bums. Uh, <laughs> Kerouac, Watts, Dick, they all yeah. converge in this place, this, yeah. this magical place yeah. over West. Exactly. So it was a very, in some ways, a very generic fantasy. I mean, that's the, it's the same image that drives Kerouac himself out of Columbia, you know, out of Manhattan to go West, right? And it itself, I, so it took me a much longer time to really grasp this, is deeply American. It's underlaid with the, the frontier thesis, mm -hmm. you know, Turner's frontier thesis. It's like there is an image of freedom and self-invention that mm -hmm. is a deep myth that is, you know, it, it, it um, stretches across traditional and, and counter-traditional mm -hmm. voyages, stories of moving, you know, putting Europe at your back yes. and going and making some kind of ideal, you know, free society. I'm getting crushed by history over here. What's yeah. over there? I was, I was in the grip of all that stuff. At the same time, I had this hero. I mean, I, you know, I, it's impossible to overstate how much I, how, how foolish and, and, and self-regarding was my identification with Philip K. Dick at that time. But I basically felt he was, he was going to ratify me. I was going to go like sit and touch the hem of his garment and he was going to say, yes, you son will <laughs> carry on my work, you know, um, which, you know, you can see in my first two novels, I'm sort of trying, I, I have no, I'm uh, no shame in, in being openly imitative of his writing in those first two books. I'm sort of trying to say, uh, you know, if you like the, his stuff, I've got more where that came from. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was going to make a personal, uh, um, pilgrimage, and then he died. He died just as I was uh, figuring out that I might be able to. Uh, to well, at that point, it was you know because I was I was not so uh, such a prodigy of rebellion. I was actually a fairly obedient kid in some other ways. I did go off to college, uh, and you then I was foot there. then I was eighteen, and and I was in Vermont, and the, like I opened the Village Voice and saw. Uh, his obituary, ah. and um, or or I think it was in the voice that I saw on the first notice. This isn't like you know today his name would be a Twitter trending topic, and you know, oh he's dead. Yeah, there you had to pick up the voice. It isn't a, it isn't a given that I, I mean I could have gone on thinking he was alive a lot longer. You know, people don't understand even how it's that weird to think now. Worked. Well, but he also wasn't famous. It's very hard to remember how not famous he ah, was yes. in '82 when he died. There was maybe a kind of a little flair around his name because of the run-up to Blade Runner. But his work was out of print, and even in science fiction, he was seen as a kind of a, a failed eccentric, like a, mm -hmm. too bad about that guy. Mm -hmm. um, he's so central now to, to American you know, counterculture, to the story of science fiction, even for some people, and I'm one of them, to the idea of the you know, post-war American letters. Mm -hmm. But he really wasn't. But anyway, my, my guy had died. My pilgrimage didn't make any sense. But I sort of, in this like chicken with its head cut off way, I sort of did it anyway. The story is almost better that way. I dropped out of college and I went and introduced myself to Paul Williams, who was his literary executor instead. And so that is what drove me, in, you know, in literal terms. It's what pulled me across the country for my, what turned out to be a decade of living in the Bay Area, working in bookstores and writing my first three and a half novels there. And... Um, and yeah, it became formative in every every possible way, including, of course, that I got to play out and expose, fulfill and expose that myth of what you can and can't get away from by running away yes. from the East Coast to the West. You know, it is it is a good place to self-invent, and yet, surprise, surprise, you brought a lot of your shit with you. <laughs> now, that, that working in bookstores you did, you've written about the work in bookstores you did on the East Coast and the West Coast, and... I wonder, thinking about the time you put in and the way you describe that time, makes me think about when I first came to Los Angeles just a few years ago. Someone said, why don't you work in a bookstore? I said, okay, that seems natural, except none would have me. And Get several jobs again. several were very clear that they'd be doing us a huge damn favor to hire us, like to work at a bookstore. Like, no, no, you'll be working in a bookstore. And I was, I was just like... I all but gave them the finger. Like it's just yeah. what what happened? What happened to the world you worked in? 
Well, they were, first of all, there were a lot more bookstores. Yeah. And second of all, I started when I was 15 and I basically presented myself on a, you know, like a paradigm that doesn't really exist anymore. I was like the shop boy. I would like <laughs> yeah. sweep up and reshelve in exchange for like an armload of books. Yeah. And I just made myself unavoidable in a series of used bookstores in Brooklyn. Scott, I mean, again, I don't want to sound too Dickensian about all this, but it really was. Another, it's a lost world already. Right. Uh, New York City was dotted with these musty kind of, uh, you know, um, unpleasant in a lot of ways, but treasure troves. Uh, the city was on its, you know, heels, and retail space was not expensive. People would run used bookstores and kind of hang out in them, and you know there wasn't the internet to to basically disembowel the viability of that business. If you wanted to find an old book, you had to go to these stores and search one them. by one. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, search was a different thing. Search meant you ask these guys, and they know what's in their shop, and they find it for you. So if you got to know their store. And you could keep it open for them because you knew what was in it because you'd been pouring over the shelves. Maybe you started to know what was in it better than uh, they did. Well, you'd suddenly made yourself invaluable. The shop kid, the annoying, pesky shop kid was suddenly a, uh, like an antiquarian. I had some knowledge. There's like, it's like being a cabbie in London. I had the knowledge. Right, yes. I, could, I, could, I could do this. So by the time I got to Berkeley, which is you know now a little bit later and also uh, – in a college town like that and with those very good bookstores that I got jobs at, Pegasus and then Moe's, which is, you know, it's like it's like the summit. <laughs> uh, that's the greatest used bookstore job in the world. Mm-hmm. I'd entered the, you know, I'd gone through the farm system and I could present myself as someone who, you know, could tell the first edition markings in, in an American 20th century hardback, literary first, you know, one from the other. Uh, that's why you didn't get that job, my friend. Yes. I, I had the knowledge and you Dude. didn't. Yeah. But also the stores were gone. The stores were gone. So you now it's to use the knowledge. Now it's a fetish. I mean, now there's so few. So to have that job, it's like it's almost it's almost like you need a trust fund. <laughs> uh, yes, it's a sort of non-job in that way. But the world of those bookstores is one of the vanished worlds you write about, but only one. I mean, you've also written about... The time and the place you grew up where the, the age of Aquarius was sort of a going concern, and readers have shown a lot of fascination with that. But I've felt myself more fascinated recently, in recent years anyway, by another time period you've written about experiencing, which was the sort of Bay Area tech utopian world of yeah. the 1980s, early 1990s, and you, where everybody was kind of a William Gibson character or an aspiring oh, William Gibson character. What? I'm, I'm gonna, when I'm really an old man, I'm going to be telling these stories and they're going to have like a ring of cyber, <laughs> cyber children around uh, sitting, sitting at my feet. I mean, I really watched the invention of that whole milieu. And it, the, what's so weird is it's, again, time moves very slowly, you know? Mm-hmm. Like we think of this stuff, this internet culture problem as being sudden, at the onset very sudden, but it was constructed and it was made up by a bunch of uh, freaks. I mean, you know, of course, I'm not, I'm not revealing something that isn't fairly well understood, but it was a Bay Area thing, partly, obviously, because of the physical reality of Silicon Valley, but also because the... Uh, what was the residue of the, you know, the Ken Kesey uh, acid futurism was the ideology that was lying around for the transformationalist rhetoric mm. that would become, right. you know, Wired magazine. It right. comes out of the whole Earth catalog. Yes, I mean, this was <laughs> the time when Timothy Leary helped make the Neuromancer computer game. Like that's the zeitgeist, yeah. right? Yeah, and but it wasn't all quite so exalted as that. I mean, I, I'll, okay, I'll tell you a story, young man. Sure. Um, so I, I worked for one of the first attempts at, you know, I don't even know what, what you would rightly call it. It was an attempt at something in between uh, a social media site before that, that ambition had been really coherently mm-hmm. defined and a, um, uh, you know, a, a successful kind of, you know, uh, internet magazine, front page, like the, the ones that seem sort of now very prosaic and mm-hmm. default to us, like Salon or Slate or, or whatever. 
and it was but it was under the umbrella of Wired magazine. It was called Hot Wired, mm-hmm. and Hot Wired was sort of like a clubhouse and sort of like a a magazine, and it was it was happening live, and you would you would sign on, but of course you were like literally signing on to these like text, extremely uh, badly supported text chat rooms. Oh, sure. And I, uh, I bet you could find these transcript of, cran- transcripts if you were like an ace Googler. <laughs> I hosted a talk show, a weekly talk show, for a very brief time on Hotwired. Uh, now, I myself did not have a computer <laughs> that could sign on, so I would go to their offices. I would drive. The Internet Highway was, for me, the Bay Bridge. I would drive <laughs> from Berkeley to San Francisco and go up to Wired and sit there and type once a week for... I don't know, an hour with some guest that I'd invited on. And then other people would come in and talk with us, except that the whole thing would crash like 15 times during the hour. And we'd we'd be like, is the guest there? Come back, you know. And, uh, you know, it was a little bit like playing Second Life, but with no no bodies or you'd always lose the person you were talking to. (laughs) Um, And I was at... Just such funny, like early parties. There was a, a a big startup. You know, they're just now coming up. Finally, maybe coming up with like the sorts of physical interfaces that would make all the all the hype around cyber sex f- faintly credible. That's a word I haven't heard in a while, by the way. Right. Well, you know, I think it's coming back because they're going to like make some some tech that will 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 will. But. Way before there was anything that would make it worth even making fun of, <laughs> there was a lot of rhetoric about how we were all suddenly going to stop having sex with each other and start having sex with machines or through machines. And there were like whole magazines and parties and, you know, subcultures built around these non existent technologies. It's really J.G. Ballard territory there, isn't it? Yeah. And, um, and then you wouldn't know what to do at them or who to, what to, what to expect from them. But it's funny stuff, and I mostly criticized it satirically by in some of my earliest short stories. I was I was I was compulsively addicted to kind of um, poking holes in the in the the rhetoric, mostly by relating it to older kinds of media hysteria because mm. you know, the thing is the 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 exaggerated fears and desires are all predicated on the idea that this is like an unprecedented revolutionary um, new medium that's going to destroy all previous <laughs> uh, technologies or languages you know people were saying things about VR that like soon there wouldn't be written or spoken language because instead we'd all like m- communicate by moving shapes and blobs around in, in space. And, um, but what's really great about it is that it's all completely right and completely wrong at the same time. I mean, we live now in the world where all of those implications are coming to be realized in some portion, but modulated the way if you weren't drunk on transformationalist rhetoric, you would have to know they were going to be modulated by corporate capitalism and sure. by um, the entrenchment of these technologies in pre-existing human culture. Mm. They don't get to uh, rewrite everything. They have to instead become intertextual with what's already right. around, and that's what they always do. So, I mean, if you look at the onset of radio, you look at the onset of, well, even photography, and certainly the moving, moving image, and you look at the, the the radical claims that were made, both pro and con, for what this was going to do to civilization. Um, they're always the same kind of thing. They're totally right. Yes, it's going to be, uh, it's going to colonize our our sense of our psyches, our sense of self. It's going to become um, impossible to imagine what the world was like before these things. But at the same time, they're going to become complicit with uh, involuntary collaborators with existing uh, modes of being, existing mediums, existing technologies. I mean, you know, when as radical as the moving picture was, it kind of didn't know what to do with itself except make theater. Yes. Right? So you got like theater, you film theater. For a long time, 
most of its radical, radical implications were left completely on the floor. You know, I mean, what do we do on the Internet? We all have these epistolary relationships. It's like Jane Austen novels. <laughs> we all uh, gossip about other mediums, television shows and, you know, rock shows and theater that we saw. And, you know, even the, 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 if you look at your home, you know, you've still got like paper and fax machines, pens and pencils. Um, the TV is still there. And we all drive around listening to radio. I mean, shouldn't radio have been destroyed like a hundred times over by now? Yeah, so if, if TV was always getting wiped clean. It, it was always being destroyed, and it's always there. I mean, <laughs> we are so much a product of radio culture. Everyone I know, without wanting to kind of grant it its power, is like, you know, a This American Life baby. I mean, my students are all saturated in radio culture. So it doesn't happen the way people want it to happen. Right. Uh, it's tremendously powerful, but it's also... Um, uh, subject to the, the the entrenched reality of the world that it that it enters into, which means it's going to be used to sell a lot of porn and to, <laughs> to gossip and uh, and to extend other purposes that already exist and that are native human purposes. Like, have you read a good book lately? Right. <laughs> it's, it's, this ties in with a point that the, the Cal Arts filmmaker Tom Anderson makes in a movie I know you're a fan of. Uh, you mentioned it in your book on They Live. Los Angeles plays itself a documentary about Los Angeles as portrayed in films over the, over the decades. He praises L.A. Confidential for accurately representing the 50s as an amalgam of all previous I, eras. That's, I mean, that's, that's what makes so much science fiction so wrong from the start. Like, from the first <laughs> frame, is that, is that everything in the in the frame is from the now of them. Right. Like, this film is set in 2037, and every technology will be like the... But we live in homes made up of all sorts of junk from, like... Right. I mean, I've got things in this room we're sitting in that are pre-war. Right. Certainly, every decade after the Second World War is well represented in this space. Mm -hmm. And then you're holding this, like, technology in my face so that you can record this, and the word podcast would sound like it was from Star Trek, sure. if it was spoken aloud um, to someone in the 1970s. Podca uh oh, they're doing a podcast. This must Engage be science podcast. Fiction. Engage podcast. Set podcast on <laughs> on bore. Sure. Um, uh, I hope I'm not. No, doing, not in this case. Um, but uh, We have to switch the other way, whatever the other <laughs> side of that is. Set podcast on fascinate. Indeed. Um, so hey, scintillate. What, 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 uh, right. So that's what, that's the thing about a good piece of, you know, and, uh, but this is true in, you know, it's what's, it's why the novels that are set now that don't want to deal with email are going to seem kind of, like, kind of baroque. Well, like Kabuki. That's what happens is if you deny the, the, the present in, in an art form, you end up slipping into, like, making, like, um, a frozen past becomes enshrined and then you have kabuki theater or you have uh, uh, Dixieland jazz. Yes, yes, yes. The Dixielandification of an art form. Right? <laughs> yeah. um, where they're just like, they see the march of next descriptions, next expressions, and they say, and they're like, they're like um, this is an old reference. I don't know if anyone gets this anymore, but uh, Steve Martin used to play this character on Saturday Night Live, uh, he was a medieval, uh, a medieval guy who would see, who would see the Enlightenment coming, and then he would say, "Nah." <laughs> <laughs> he would be he would be like a medieval lawyer, and he, Steve Martin would be like in the middle of drowning witches to see if they were witches, and <laughs> um, you know, weighing people to see if they were guilty of crimes, mm. and then beheading them. And he would suddenly stop and give the speech. He would say, "Wait, I see a great future where we have a jury of our peers, and it will be eleven. No." 13, no, 12 people. And, <laughs> and he describes the entire, you know, not that this is not actually a medieval system, but he describes the, the, the uh, future of, of jurisprudence and then says, he thinks it over and goes, nah, and he goes back to drowning the witch. <laughs> and that's like Dixieland jazz. It's like the art form that sees the implications and, and expressions required of it to... To just to keep up with reality, which is monstrously complex and, and overwhelming, it's a 
it's a brutal task for the artist to even encounter it glancingly hmm. and but declines that task entirely and says let's just make a nice story <laughs> about so these weird. people who are familiar and comfortable to me and so they better not go on online because that's where all that crappy stuff is <laughs> they might see a pop-up ad and then i'll feel really yucky oh, you know sure, sure. <laughs> keep, keep the ziploc bag yeah. sealed now that's it i haven't myself written any really effective fiction about the pre exact the real present of the internet mm -hmm. that is a grievously difficult task because of the way the the codes and um, languages are turning over, you know, in this sort of, with almost almost um, this sort of giddy way of making things seem seem wrong. The minute you write them down, they seem wrong. Mm -hmm. In Chronic City, I tried to do something with the relationship of people to screens, and I I realized, as with a lot of things, the only way I could even get close to writing about this thing, it was so. Uh, perplexing and so enormous was to write about it from the point of view of someone totally stupid about it. Uh, you know, like the way I dealt with physics and as she climbed across the table was to write about this guy from the humanities who's terrified of particle physics. The whole thing is um, a metaphor for how irrelevant he is. That's the only way he can relate to it is it's coming to get me. Particle physics hates me. And so I kind of wrote about these these stoop noggles in Conic City who go online to participate in... Um, in eBay auctions, mm. well, you know, it was a way to do something with the screen life that wouldn't date because it was so ridiculously dated to begin with. Yeah. It was like for them to, to to bid on eBay was a radical encounter with, with with the with the uh, digital frontier, mm. and for them it was as as uh, uh, toxic and overwhelming and 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 um, and seductive mm. uh, as screens are for 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 all of us at times. Mm. And that was a way to get some of what I was, you know, some of my own feelings and apprehensions onto the page. It's really, it's a really hard job. Mm. Uh, so I don't want to seem to be claiming to have, uh, you know, uh, surrounded it, that task with lots and lots of good results. It's, it's, it's I've barely, barely managed it at all directly. I, 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 I seem to want to do it metaphorically instead, you know, mm. to, to do like what, uh, Howard Hawks called the three corner shot, you know, mm. in pool. You get at it, but not by going, not but by aiming your cue stick at it. These these spots where all eras meet and where all degrees of rightness and wrongness meet. Those are the most interesting ones, aren't they? I mean, I think of before I was saying I don't get sold on a writer because they get called good. But one of the things that sells me on Philip K. Dick was that fans, fans, you included, bit the biggest Philip K. Dick fan around, say half his books are bad. <laughs> then I turn my head. Then, oh wait, half his books are bad. Something. What's what is so compelling about the fact that half his books are good, half are bad? That's really funny. I mean, well, you know, there are different kinds of artists, and and uh, there, are, you know, I mean, just to put just to put it in a an analogous context, you know, there's there's. Um, there's a artist like, what's his name? Bride Strip Bear by her, her bachelor's. Oh, uh, Duchamp? By, by, like Duchamp, who makes like seven or eight overwhelming, totalizing gestures. And sort of every, every work is essential. Mm -hmm. He works really slowly, pulls a lot of stuff back. It stays in the workshop forever. And then there's a, a surrealist, you know, for me, every bit as nourishing a sensibility and, and, uh, and involving a sensibility like De Chirico, who just painted, and he painted canvas after canvas, and you can even look at them and know that the paint is applied rather thinly. Because <laughs> he had a next picture he wanted to make, and about half of his paintings are terrible. <laughs> I mean, and for him, the good ones concentrate in a uh, somewhat in a cluster of, of years, and then there's several decades where there are predominantly bad ones. But there are good ones that get thrown up in the middle of the bad decades. You can't write off De Carico's subsequent decades. He just painted a lot. He wanted to paint a lot. Um, and um, uh, there's a certain kind of vitality uh, and impatience and uh, a kind of investigation that's being conducted in that manner of working. And anyway, that practice, that habit, seems to be what they were made of it's who they were it's what they it's it's temperament uh you know i i'm i'm not as i'm somewhere in between i'm i'm more more deliberate than than de Chirico or 
or dick, I revise more diligently uh, than than dick ever learned to I mean, his uh, also it's also material conditions the way his career developed you know i mean who knows people come out of historical class you know uh material circumstances he was he got he got cast in this role as a pulp writer and at at various levels i mean it, his his life story is a great testament to uh the you know complexity of artistic self-regard right it, there were times when he thought he'd wasted his life. There were other times when he uh, was sure that he was a sublime artist whose, whose work transcended its, you know, critical reputation or or, or the, the context it was published in and everything in between. And he made fun of himself and he, he um, you know, he, he, he lived with this uh, cognitive dissonance about the value of what he was doing. Mm. It was very exaggerated in his case, but a lot of artists are going around unsure you know, I mean, it's one thing we're always we're always supposed to like represent ourselves coherently, but I feel differently about my game every day. Right. You know, uh, and God, he was he was a you know a, a hyper developed version of this uh, incoherent self construction <laughs> as an artist. Anyway, he made what he could make uh, based on what he was getting paid and how he felt and and. Uh, and how much of a rush he felt to, to, to get on to the next one. Mm. Or how desperately he craved that, you know, ambivalent but intense s- sensation of saying, fuck it, I'm done, and then publishing something. <laughs> uh, yes, 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 yes. Uh, so, you know, um, sure, half his things are bad, but that's not how, uh, you know, we all are very conscious of making these uh, damning, you know, I mean, if half of everything was 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 bad, we'd be in great shape. Yes. <laughs> right. If half of the internet was bad and the, the other half was good, my God. Oh my God. <laughs> if half of you know, uh, if every every artist was fifty percent worthwhile, right. wow, we'd be we'd be uh, in in, a, in an amazing place. We'd be in some sort of we'd actually we'd be tripping on the on the uh, overabundance. We already are. We already mm. are. And not half of everything is good. Maybe like one little fifth of everything is 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 worth your time, and but that's not how uh, cultural history moves forward. It moves forward on that five percent, uh, or 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 I said fifth and five percent. I'm mixing up percentages. Well, according to Theodore Sturgeon, ninety percent of everything is crap. <laughs> let's let's go with five percent. Sure. Um, you know, and it's we're very we're very kind to the past. We think it's as if. There was only, you know, Shakespeare and Tolstoy and Kafka. And then, oh, look, we came along and we've got all this bad stuff and we're embarrassed for ourselves. Look, there was always stuff that had to be had to fall away. A filter of time. Yeah, it's just it just does its job. Not all European movies are good. Filter so of distance. So beautifully. Yeah, filter of distance works nicely, too. Um, it does its job. And um, so s- railing against the fact that artistic production, artistic engagement means that we're going to have a lot of not such great stuff piling up too. In fact, it's going to pile infinitely higher than the good stuff is not the point. You know, it's, it's just, uh, it's really distracting when, when people start to think there's some sort of crime being created. Uh, the idea of, you know, I, I always think it's a very aging artist who's actually probably struggling with, uh, individual fate with fear of death or something mm. who suddenly comes down from their mountaintop, you know, to, to proclaim against over publishing. Oh, there are too many novels. What's wrong now? Is there too many novels? What's wrong is you're feeling old today. Sure. It's okay. There's never a problem. We will sort through it. Mm. It takes care that, that really does get taken care of. In fact, people are, um, are obsessed. I myself have been obsessed with that procedure. And then you see a, a program like the New York review of books, republications, which simultaneously is really an argument, both that preservation is possible, it's joyous, yes. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it, it's collective. Lots of people, you know, Edwin Frank is, is, is doing this. He's driving that sublime shelf of books that's accumulating, but he's also... Can I see a stack of them behind he's you? He's also though? open. You know, he listens. I've whispered in his ear. I know lots of other writers and critics have gotten to suggest titles, which... It, 
it's an argument for over publica- publication if ever there was one. What if someone in 1957 had been like, or whatever year, had said, uh, we can only do, you know, we can only do Bello and we don't have room for, you know, this other book that's not going to sell very many copies, which now everyone's reading in its New York Review of right. Books Rediscovery Edition and it seems, it seems seminal to us or, or, you know, not everything even has to be seminal, just good, just right. like great, great experience to be had. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's very dangerous that we, we well, I'm talking so much, but okay, it's very dangerous that, uh, we live in such a, um, utilitarian culture. This, this, uh, idea that everything has a use value and everything has to be, um, edifying and important in some way. I mean, it's nice to be called important. I've, 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 I've let a couple of my books get that claim attached to them and I feel great about it. But actually, I just want them to be, like great experiences for the reader. I don't think there's some hierarchy where you can just be like, what was the most important novel of 1973? And I mean, Gravity's Rainbow, right? <laughs> but do I want the rest of 1973 to evaporate? Does Gravity's Rainbow even mean anything if the context isn't there? Right. It's a dialogue. It's a, it's In a, a top gi- 10 list. There's just one item there yeah. or it's all 10. Yeah. It's a giant dialogue and you have to be nihilistic about culture to want the other things to go away, the context, the the vibrations that come from all of these things existing and jostling and offering their, you know, like on different days, my idea of what uh, kind of novel I love most changes. Sometimes I want to read like a Brian Moore novel. Mm. Now, you know, I don't even know what novel Brian Moore published in 1973, but there are a lot of days when that's the book I want to read instead of Gravity's Rainbow. He's like an elegant uh charming, empathic, compassionate, witty writer of unmistakably traditional novels. If you see the form as being only driven by radical innovators, he doesn't exist. He doesn't register. He has no reason for being. But I actually think that the novel is a more capacious and much more traditional and heterodox form than that. And Brian Moore is like, there are a lot of days when he's my favorite novelist. Mm. Because he just does what the novel does so beautifully and with such, uh, you know, not effortless grace, but effortful grace. Mm-hmm. Like you can feel him writing and you're like, yeah, that chapter is, is, is a, is, is a, is a killer. It just like, it sings. I just, I'm very anti hierarchical and I really cast a lot of suspicion on the, uh, fantasies of uh, exclusion. You know, oh, let's stop publishing all the non-important books. <laughs> what a what a dystopian Besides that. Uh, fantasy that is. Now, finally, speaking of dystopian fantasies, this is a question I can't resist asking, but uh, the movie Blade Runner is, of course, a Philip K. Dick adaptation. Uh, it's in Los Angeles Plays Itself, the Tom Anderson documentary we discussed. How big a part does that film play in sort of establishing your Los Angeles of the mind, that city an hour's train ride over to the west? Mm. You know, I, it's Brooklyn looms large in your mind. The Bay Area, I'm sure, does. Yeah. Los Angeles, is that still a city for you constructed by these fictions like Blade Runner, like they live? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely a work in progress in terms of like a, having an L.A., Sensibility. I mean, you did set a book here, of course. I I'll set say a, that. I set a book there in Silver Lake. I'm not saying here because I know better than to act like Claremont is Silver Lake. That's the thing is I find L.A. to be yes. very... Yeah, we're nowhere near Los Angeles right now. It's very large. It's very distributed. Right. It's very uh, incoherent and, um, and uh, the different parts agitate and vibrate against each other. But they're also uh, really local, and so you know my my take in progress is that any take would be facile. That the place is really specific. So like I you know, but that's what it is to care about a place. You don't really you know if if you just think that like Brooklyn is cool, you probably don't know Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. You've got to be aware that the place is contradictory and inflected and var- varied and and um and Los Angeles seems to me to demand a lot of microscopic work. I don't know if I'm the guy to do it. I have so many previous engagements, you, know, you might so, say. Yes. Um I'd like to write well about 
L.A. I mean, I, I didn't do it in a serious sense in You Don't Love Me Yet. I'll be the first to say that. I used it as a kind of a proscenium arch. Mm. That book is overtly uh, Midsummer Night's Dream. It's a, it's a, a fantasy hipster forest. <laughs> <laughs> and in some ways, in fact, that book is a kind of a, a bit of a bait and switch or a, a sleight of hand is a better word for it because I was writing in a s somewhat serious way about experiences I'd had uh, in the 80s in the Bay Area. Mm. If anything, the Silver Lake in that book is a transposed mission area. Mm. It's, it's Mission and Guerrero and Dolores and Valencia in the late 80s and early 90s when I was spending a lot of time there. And I just took some of those feelings, some of those burrito joints and some of those <laughs> late nights and some of those lost relationships and friendships and I kind of moved them into Silver Lake because I could because I had because I had a street map of LA and I could name the streets <laughs> but I didn't use LA in a sense that I claimed it as a serious subject I was I was using it like a stage set for a, a, a sex comedy yes and so it's really like the forest in, in Midsummer Night's Dream now whether I could ever get into a more uh, direct engagement isn't the word for it, more I don't know, open my pores to the layers, start to see the layers of history and how they stack up to make the present in some segment of a, of a, you know, Los Angeles urban setting for, for a, a, a story, a substantial story or series of stories or a novel. I don't know. I, I'd love to, I'd love to think I'm going to do that, but I'm not sure being out here in Claremont, uh, equips me to do, uh, to do that yet. I guess there's layers here in Claremont too, right? I haven't spent much time here. Claremont, you spend more. Claremont's interesting. It's like, um, you know, somebody, uh, there's a street sign. I mean, a, not a street sign, a, just literally a sign someone's got on their house, on their porch that says, you are now entering Bedford Falls. <laughs> and the thing about Claremont is that it is, you know, on the good days, it's Bedford Falls. On the bad days, it's Stepford. Oh. Uh, you know, or on the, you know, on the really bad days, it's the village from the prisoner. It's a, it's a, it's a, a bubble and everything. It's huh? a fantasy of uh, an enclosure where a perfect 1950s suburb can be, uh, can be collectively enacted. And believe me, that's not. I don't mean that only critically or only scoffingly. It's a very seductive, you know, having grown up with the fantasy through watching, you know. Uh, you know, Douglas Sirk movies and Twilight Zone episodes sure. and reading John Carver and Richard Yates. And uh, and it's a wonderful life. Uh, the idea of the town that really is, you know, it's we're we're um, we're all making it. We're all making Claremont feel that way willingly for the good schools, for the cozy, safe streets and the pleasant restaurants. And yet we're swimming in a a desert of the real, as Baudrillard would put it. <laughs> the drought, you know, you, you're you in this, it's a, for, among other things, this place is a bio, uh, it's a, it's a biological, or, uh, what should I call it, botanical fiction. Mm. The green, the tall trees, the shady trees, you know, you just drive literally across the dividing line to Upland and suddenly you're in flat yellow desert. Mm. And the water that's poured into this locality to keep the fiction alive that we're really in a Connecticut suburb, <laughs> you know, um, that we're really in Williamstown, Massachusetts or something. Uh, so this is a really interesting uh, subject, potentially, that does actually interface with things I've thought about my whole life. Would I have known that Claremont existed if I hadn't taken this job? No. But but its, uh, it, it's reality field is, is quite specific and... and yeah, I could I could conceivably make something of that. I'm feeling a rich paranoia about it already. Good. There you go. <laughs> I've been speaking here in that botanic fiction slash community slash simulacrum slash much else besides of Claremont with Jonathan Lethem, who is here at the uh, here at Pomona College, the Roy E. Disney professor of uh, professor in creative writing. Excuse me. He's the author of novels, including most recently uh, Dissident Gardens, nonfiction collections, most recently. Uh, the Ecstasy of Influence, and short story collections most recently, well, going to be a new one this next year with a new title, which is what again? Lucky Allen is the new book.
Lucky Ellen is that new book, and much else besides. Jonathan, thanks so much for taking the time today. You bet. It was great talking. This has been the Los Angeles Review of Books podcast. You can keep up with me at colinmarshall.org and with the LARB at lareviewofbooks.com. Thanks.